traveling halfway around the world, tourists arrive in Canada's north to experience one of the wonders of nature. Here, they behold the cosmic dance of color and light, the Aurora Borealis. Since the beginning of time, people have gazed into the night skies, spellbound by the northern lights, in awe of their power, searching for meaning. Some secrets are revealed in northern legends. Some knowledge has been gained by scientific exploration, but there is much about the northern lights that remains a mystery. People who live in the lands circling the North Pole have knowledge of the aurora that has evolved over years of watching the winter skies. In Canada's high Arctic, ICP Kanguk shares a popular Inuit belief. When you watch the northern lights, it seems as if they are running around, and if you whistle at them, the lights will come down closer, as if to see who calls them. Elisipi Utava tells her grandchildren an Inuit tale about the land of the Northern Lights. I'm going to tell you a story about a shaman. He chanted and played his drum, calling on his helping spirit. In his trance, he went far away from the igloo, far into the heavens, among the stars and the northern lights. In this bright place were a lot of people playing football with a walrus skull. The skull rolled and rolled until the tusks stuck into the ground. Kick the ball, they said. But he was afraid. Come, play with us. He found his courage and kicked between the tusks. Then he saw that these people were our relatives who had died and gone away to this joyous land of the dead. These spirits of the sky have also inspired scientists around the world. The aurora is perhaps the most beautiful natural phenomenon in the world. And its majestic beauty has attracted many, many famous scientists in the, in the past. 
Dalton, uh, Faraday, Thompson, many, many famous physicists. And naturally, uh, everyone would like to know why such a beautiful phenomenon takes place. It's like a first love when you start to study it, start to look at it. You cannot be neutral. You know, rural scientists are kind of very lucky people because uh, they get a chance to actually see what they're studying just by going out and looking up in the sky. I mean, it's really quite interesting when you can see the very physics that you're trying to study unfolding before your very eyes straight above you. The Northern Lights have fascinated scholars since the dawn of history. In the fourth century BC, Aristotle described the lights as jumping goats caused by vapors evaporating from the earth and set on fire by meteors. In the Middle Ages, Vikings believed that the aurora were fires shining at the edge of a flat world. So this is, so to say, some, a few of the old classical books we have about aurora. Alf we have Eglund, many, a physicist many at the University of Oslo in Norway, is a collector of archival books about the aurora. There are several books covering the period from 1740 to about 1790, connected with different phenomena in Aurora. Another belief, popular throughout Europe and North America for almost 500 years, was that glaciers absorbed light from the midnight sun of summer, then released it during the dark winter months. In 1707, a Norwegian priest, Jonas Ramos, theorized that there was an underground heat source beneath Greenland. A hole in a magnetic mountain of iron let the smoke and steam escape to form the aurora borealis. If we go to our neighbor country, of course they have also quite a lot of publication from the academy in Sweden. And in particular, I would like to mention the work by Anders Celsius and uh, Olaf Jurtar. In his controversial thesis, Celsius criticized all the wild speculations to date, urging scholars to base their theories on accurate observations of the aurora. In Russia, Mikhail Lomonosov, like his colleague Benjamin Franklin in the United States, took up the challenge. Lomonosov conducted some of the first auroral experiments with electricity and recorded the forms of the lights in his drawings. We are now in a very exciting place. It's a place in Leningrad, in the heart, and I would say the origin of science in our country where Lomonosov himself worked and observed stars, observed aurora, and he has written himself very detailed descriptions. He tried to establish the explanation of this great phenomenon. He thought that it is deeply connected with electrical force, and this may now be considered as just prophetic because it's quite right from the point of view of contemporary science. A man of genius in many areas, Lomonosov is still revered today as the father of Russian science. Up until the time of his death, Lomonosov was still writing his lengthy monograph about the origin of the Aurora Borealis. His poetry, inspired by the Aurora, is recited to this day. But where, O oh nature, is thy law? From the midnight lands comes up the dawn. Is it not the sun setting his throne? Is it not the icy seas that are flashing fire?
The northern lights have always been a part of the sky, the folklore, and the science of Norway. Many Norwegians made discoveries in the early 1900s that earned them a reputation as pioneers of auroral research. The most controversial question concerning northern light up to Professor Sturmer's time was the height of the aurora. From 1910 to 1913, Carl Sturmer and his research assistants took 9,000 sets of photographs from two locations in the Norwegian north. Using triangulation, Sturmer estimated that the lights are between 105 and 130 kilometers above the Earth, with the lowest lights coming as close as 65 kilometers. Modern technology has proven the accuracy of Sturmer's calculations, but the strange stories persist. We have several reports on aurora going all the way up to 1,000 kilometers. On the other hand, there are also quite a few individual reports saying that aurora can come all the way down to the Earth's surface. In 1929, Corporal E.B. Blatter of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police was traveling by dog team across the Yukon Territory. I walked to the lake for some ice, and upon my return to the tent, all around and through the willows, everything was very bright and hard on the eyes. The Sami of northern Scandinavia tell frightening stories of times when the northern lights came to earth. Long time ago, there was a girl and a boy. They teased and insulted the northern lights. Northern lights got angry and came nearer and nearer, and it burned them. It turned them to stone. This story has always been told by our people, the Sami. Though people who live on the land continue to tell of the lights dipping to earth, scientists are skeptical. In universities around the world, the search for answers continued. What causes the colors in the lights? In the 1920s, another Norwegian physicist, Lars Vergard, measured the wavelengths of over 40 auroral colors with his spectrograph. Don McEwen, of the University of Saskatchewan continues this work using a spectrometer, the modern equivalent of Vergard's instrument. Spectrometers are an important tool for studying the aurora. They are able to take in the light emitted from the aurora and break it up into its component wavelengths and then by analyzing these spectra we can learn a lot about the, the mechanisms producing aurora and the very things which are going on within the aurora. The scientists knew that our atmosphere was mostly nitrogen and oxygen gases with spectroscopy, it was discovered that the atoms and molecules of these gases are hit by a highly energized force, which causes them to emit light. Atomic oxygen glows with a yellowish-green hue. Nitrogen produces the violet-blue aurora, 
and the crimson red that appears along the lower edge of the auroral curtain. Folklore explains the colors of the aurora in a different way. Tatiana Vyazova, a Russian scientist, recounts the Germanic Norse legend of the Valkyrie goddesses. В этих мифах, которые распределяли в битвах жизнь и смерть воинов, они battles raged throughout the land, and the ravens kept count of the dead. They reported to their master Odin, the one-eyed god of the underworld. With orders to bring the victims to Odin, the Valkyrie rode out into the night where the trains of their colored dresses painted aurora across the sky. In 1957-58, during the International Geophysical Year, scientists around the world made an all-out effort to document the movement and brightness of the aurora. 114 technical cameras were aimed skyward to record the aurora borealis in the Arctic and the aurora australis in the Antarctic. Using this photographic data, Yasha Feldstein of the Soviet Union discovered the aurora do not appear randomly across the sky, but form ovals, halos of light that circle our magnetic north and south poles. The first satellite, Sputnik 1, shot into space in 1957, and the space race began. The United States followed three months later with the Explorer 1 satellite. The detectors on board discovered radiation belts, proof that the auroral zone surrounding our planet was not empty. At 9.07 Moscow time, I heard the whistle, then the growing roar, and then I felt the gigantic spaceship begin to tremble and slowly disengage from the launch mechanism. It soon became clear that all space missions, manned and unmanned, would be affected by auroral activity. In 1963, auroral physicists were part of the team that sent Yuri Gagarin into space. Analyzing early satellite data, the physicists began to realize that there were complex forces interacting in the area of space just above our planet. Yuri Galperin was an advisor on most of these early Soviet space missions. It was clear that there must be some inner space, but uh, to what extent uh, it was, uh, what is the border, only was possible to establish by space probes. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire. seconds after blastoff, it encounters the maximum area of cosmic rays. 75 to 80 miles up, the auroral zone. Still more data was needed to understand the space above our planet. In Canada and around the world, rockets continued to probe the auroral regions. By the early 1960s, the scientists agreed that there was a large region of inner space controlled by our Earth's magnetic field lines. It was named the magnetosphere, extending millions of kilometers into space. This magnetic armor protects us from the hostile forces that flow through the solar system. 
Back in the 19th century, Christian Birkeland had foreseen the existence of the magnetosphere and proven it when he built a model of the Earth's magnetic field in his laboratory. This is the model of the Earth, what he called the Terella. With the cables going in, as we can see here, he had an artificial magnet, so it was the Earth with its, its magnetic field. And he shoot electrons against the Terella in the center here, and in that way, he produced artificial aurora in a laboratory in 1896. But where do the forces come from that interact with our magnetosphere to create the aurora? Birkeland concluded that they must come from the sun. Approximately every 11 years, explosions on our sun reach their peak. Beginning as sunspots, they erupt and create solar flares shooting tens of thousands of kilometers into space, enormous relative to the scale model of Earth. Reaching temperatures of 20 million degrees Celsius, they propel radiation and plasma, the charged gas of space, throughout the solar system. This is the solar wind. The solar wind streams past the planets at more than a million kilometers per hour and ultimately collides with the sun side of our magnetosphere. The strength of our magnetic shield deflects most of the wind and it keeps blowing past the Earth, creating a tail that stretches millions of kilometers into space. Most of the particles of a solar wind, as it's called, are deflected around our shield and just disappear off out into deep, deep space. But some of those particles manage to leak in. We're very interested in the science of how the leaking in happens, but for the moment, we know it gets in and they come down into the regions of the Earth, 10 to 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, where there is an amazing region where the particles are accelerated. And you can imagine them cruising down the magnetic field lines and they get caught in the accelerator and they're gunned into the upper atmosphere. When they come down to about oh, 100 or 200 kilometers up, they start hitting the atmospheric particles, the oxygen and the nitrogen, and they hit them and they make them glow. And that's what people see as the Northern Lights. respect the Northern Lights, for they have become a symbol of nature's strength. To do research on the Northern Lights, I think, is wrong. The Northern Lights belong to nature, and it is something that human beings should not investigate because it has a power that is stronger than the strength of man. Scientists are like the scouts were in front of the wagon trains that went west in this continent back in the days of the, of the early explorers. And, you know, most of the time they'd ride out there and they'd eat and they'd ride and they'd eat and they'd ride and they wouldn't seem to contribute anything at all. And yet, if you told any wagon master, well, look, you know, all these guys do is eat and they cost money, we don't need them. The wagon master would have refused to go forward because he would know that those guys would earn their keep the day that they stopped an ambush. And in a way, the scientists are scouts. They are trying to help society in the way that they will not be ambushed by nature. 
Because when I was in school, I, I, um, I mean, we learned all the the same things as anybody learns about the scientific method and all of that. But there's some things that um, I think only uh, happen to to native people. Uh, I think there's some things that uh, you know on, only certain kinds of people know. One of my brothers was telling me that if a person leaves this camp really early, the dogs move faster because they can hear the sound that the northern lights make. He said it, it, it really makes the dogs travel fast. Is there any way you could hear an aurora? That, that was a really interesting conjecture because a lot of people have said they've heard it, but every scientific instrument that's been put out there has not so-called heard it. They move around in circles, and that's when I, I heard it. it. Makes a sort of a whooshing sound. You know, you're quite right that no scientific detector in the audio frequency range has ever heard the Northern Lights. Just recently, I heard that scientists uh, aren't able to measure the sound. Well, I I don't know how to explain that. I. It has to be something in the human mind and, you know, something perhaps like sensory crosstalk where uh, if you see a blinding flash of light, you actually think you should be hearing a noise. For a moment, I thought I was hearing things, but there was a distinct swishing sound that sounded very much like uh, when, you, when you pull clothes apart from the dryer. Maybe the sounds are just hallucinations of the human ear because it has nothing else to hear. Well, the key is it's all in the mind. When one considers the Inuit claim, I think a lot of uh, credibility has to be given to that. Inuits are perhaps the great observers of, of Arctic, uh, Arctic phenomena. It's too easy to explain the sound that the lights make by simply saying it's ice cracking or it's the wind. Inuit know what the sound of ice cracking is like. They know the various sounds the winds make one shouldn't dismiss too easily the claims that they make that uh, under certain conditions uh, the auroral displays are, are accompanied by sound. Though northern people suspect the ways of science, the researchers continue to probe the aurora. New data collected from rockets suggests that auroral activity may cause ozone depletion. The project leader is Dr. Charles Barth. We're studying how the aurora changes the composition of the atmosphere. The atmosphere of the Earth is, is made up of these, uh, these very pleasant gases that, that uh, you and I are able to, to breathe, the oxygen and the, and the nitrogen. But in the upper atmosphere, during an auroral storm, lots of electrons come into the atmosphere. And what they do is they, they break up the nitrogen molecules, they break up the oxygen molecules, and they turn a part of the atmosphere in, into another molecule called nitric oxide. And the theory says, maybe that nitric oxide helps destroy some of the ozone. On my mark, we will be at T minus 10 minutes and counting on pad two. Mark, T minus 10 minutes and counting. Let's have station status checks on channel two, please. All stations are go and the range is go. Mark, T minus one minute and counting. Five, four, three, two, one. Fire. It's important uh, at this juncture in man's history when we can see changes uh, occurring in the atmosphere. It's important that we thoroughly understand what nature has been doing all these millions of years. Our natural world is a complex balance of forces. Just as the aurora may be responsible for ozone depletion, there may be other strong effects on Earth. 
Northern people have always felt this. Ja, då är det skogsrastalami där mot Polarsland. And they go like this. They nearly burn me. I used to hide under a reindeer sledge. When I am up in the mountains with the herd, I have to hide under the snow to escape from it before it burns me. Like all other people who live in the land circling the northern pole, the Chuchi reindeer herders of far eastern Siberia tell tales that warn of the power in the northern lights. <laughs> We often saw very strong northern lights, and my grandmother told us that we should try to chase the lights away. She said that if we threw a rock at the northern lights, and if it split in half and then fell to the ground, that meant that the northern lights would go away, and the weather would be good the next day. But if the rock fell to the ground in one piece, that meant that the northern lights would stay, and there would be a fierce storm the next day so fierce that it would blow down our harenga. The effects of the northern lights on weather have been observed for several hundred years. We have a book published in Norway already in 1741 by a sea captain, Johan Heitman. And the title of the book is just concerned with the relation between weather and northern light. And in that book, he used the northern light as a very reliable uh, prediction for what kind of weather he is going to have when he go out fishing and then go out on some big sailing trips. We will probably learn more about this interaction. But what the future will bring in this respect is probably as difficult to predict as the weather itself. Доктор Лялин, подойдите, пожалуйста, к диспетчеру с картой вызова. Доктор Лялин. There are many ways that the aurora affect our lives. In the Soviet North, aurora are used to predict when extra ambulances are needed. It is believed that the health of people in critical condition or with heart problems deteriorates during an intense auroral storm, possibly due to fluctuating magnetic field lines. Studies indicate that airline crews have four times the expected rate of brain cancer, largely due to the radiation they are exposed to when they fly the polar routes. When space travelers leave their craft, they're protected from radiation with specially designed spacesuits. Intense auroral activity distorts radio waves worldwide and can even interfere with military communication. March 13, 1989. The Aurora created a power outage throughout the entire province of Quebec. The blackout hit just after 8 o'clock. Montreal, Quebec City, Trois-Rivières, the entire province from Hull to Gaspé thrown into darkness. There was a sudden power surge in northern Quebec, just a fraction of a second. And then, like a big circuit breaker, the whole system shut down. At its peak, an auroral display can produce more than a billion watts of power and seriously distort the magnetic field lines of our planet. What physicists learned a long time ago, and it's called Faraday's Law, 
and that is that any time you have a changing magnetic field, you will induce electric fields in any nearby conductors. And one nice nearby conductor, insofar as the auroral regions are concerned, are power lines strung along the Earth's surface. And of course, now we come to Quebec Hydro, where you have very, very long power lines strung from where the generating station is all the way down to where the users are. And along came this enormous effect associated with the storm of March the 13th, 1989. And it basically cascaded through the system and shut the entire power distribution system down for nine hours. And it was all due to the fluctuating magnetic fields caused by the electric currents right in the region where the northern lights are. I used to be afraid of the northern lights, for I have heard that they are capable of severing heads from people. They are capable of taking up someone when they get too close to the ground. We would make sounds with our fingernails so the northern lights would get higher in the sky. When one wishes to get the northern lights to back off, one should lash the whip to make sure that a whizzing sound is created in the process. In eastern Siberia, an Eskimo poetess, Zoya Nyemlukina, has overcome her people's traditional fear of the northern lights. It was forbidden even in your thoughts to admire the idea of the northern lights. But I dared, in my childish attempt to break the century's curse. I saw flashes, and I could not utter a word from happiness. The northern lights are ladies doing a lightning dance in their festival dresses and our village dancers try to copy these dances and follow the wonderful patterns. celebrate the wonder of the northern lights. Flash, flash, it went up in the sky. All night long burned the beautiful blue northern lights. In European and culture, children hear of their magic in the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. Hiss, hiss, it went in the air, as if the sky was red with fire. Those are my old northern lights, said the reindeer. Look at how they flash. And then he ran on, faster than ever, day and night. A Dene of northern Canada tells her grandchildren of the time when the northern lights helped their ancestors. Many years ago, the slavey people of Fort Good Hope chose their strongest hunters to go on a trip to hunt for caribou. Their leader was a powerful medicine man. After many days, they reached the hunting grounds and made camp. Then one night, the Chippewayan attacked. Midnight, 
he stood beneath the northern lights. He called on their power and cast the light around the others. The hunters were lifted high into the lights. They lost all sense of time and place. By morning's light, the hunters were back in their home camp at Fort Good Hope. The Northern Lights had saved them. High above the Arctic Circle, Tromsø, Norway has always been ideally located for auroral study. Here, using advanced technology, the aurora can be studied even during the daylight hours when they cannot be seen. Six European countries operate ISCAT, the largest radar system in the world. Eight different experiments in advanced physics can be done at the same time on separate receiving channels. Using the huge quantities of data collected at ISCAT and shared on scientific computer networks throughout the world, physicists are developing many new auroral theories. As the quest for knowledge accelerates, scientists from many countries collaborate on new ways of gathering data. The Swedish Space Corporation satellite, Viking, launched from an Ariane spacecraft in French Guiana, carried a Canadian-designed auroral camera on board. The camera could very easily be blinded if direct light from the sun Working with a team of over 20 Canadian scientists, side. Dr. The Alistair Valance-Jones of the National Research Council in Ottawa was in charge of the optics for this prototype camera. This happening. Over 45,000 very fine uh, pictures were obtained during the 14-month life of the satellite. This has been a big step forward in making it possible to record the development of aurora on a global scale over the northern polar cap. Find out where this uh, position is. Okay. Let's do a point on it. At the University of Calgary, Canadian scientists continue to analyze the Viking images. This is a very nice picture of the entire rural oval taken from the Swedish Viking satellite. It's taken in May, and it shows that you have aurora not only in the nighttime, where people who are on the ground looking at the aurora commonly think of it as occurring, but also in the daytime. And it shows very clearly that we have emissions from the aurora both on the day side and the night side. This is a very large circle of light. In fact, the distance from one side to the other is 4,000 kilometers. We just calculated the area of this intensification in the midnight sector known as a substorm and it's about a million square kilometers. If we look at the position of that on the Earth, we see that it's occurring over the Canadian region just to the south and west of Hudson's Bay. The northern lights often shine brightly over Canada as the energized particles follow the field lines that lead to the magnetic North Pole in Canada's Arctic. Many more satellites will be launched in an all-out effort to explore the complex interactions between the sun, the earth, and the northern lights. Eventually man is going to go out into space and eventually man is going to exploit space, perhaps by having solar power satellites up there. The environment you may think is a vacuum out there, but indeed, the very fact that you have the northern lights tells you it's not a vacuum at all. In fact, it's quite a hostile environment for anything electronic. Many, many satellites have suffered difficulties out there by virtue of the particles that they are hit by that actually destroy the electronic components. 
There are certain regions of space where those particles are. There are regions of space where they aren't. We've got to learn that. We've got to know where the trouble is. We've got to know how the particles are accelerated so that we can protect ourselves and the people who follow us when we go out into space. So there are very good practical reasons, unless you want to sit on the Earth forever, and I don't think mankind wants to do that. Sometimes I feel um, something spiritual about Northern Lights. Um, and it gives me this feeling that it's sort of dancing because I'm there, because he knows I'm there. Science has parted the curtains that hang in the polar skies. And we have glimpsed far into the solar system. But the mysteries still linger. Traditional beliefs still echo through the ages. Sometime in the future, the Northern Lights may share more of their secrets. Sometime when we are ready to grasp their meaning.